Now is the time. Well, I, um, I don't think Jesse's going to wait for them, actually. He's on the podium now. We're going to wait to see if he... Well, he somehow I think this is the beginning of a long list of things Jesse's not going to do by the book. First oh, of all... Oh, it's tough. Wait, first of all... And I say... The, hold, hold it down if we can for a minute. And I say this very sincere. Thank you. Thank you for renewing my faith that the American dream still lives. You know, it was back in 64 that a hero and an idol of mine named Muhammad Ali beat Sonny Liston. And I remember, in those days, you listened on the radio. And I remember my dad and my brother and I listening on the radio. And he did it. He won. He shocked the world. No one said he could do it. Then, well, then in later years, I think it was 1980, we sent a hockey team to the Olympics. A, bu a bunch of amateur kids who weren't given a chance. They had to face the Russians who were like professionals. Nobody gave them a chance. And what happened? They shocked the world. Well, now it's 1998, and the American dream lives on in Minnesota because we shocked the world. Okay. Can you smoke outside? I'll smoke outside. Yeah. Thank you. We should quit altogether. Yeah, you can do the clap. Okay. <laughs> when did I decide that I wouldn't be a Democrat or Republican when I made the decision to run for governor? First, we'll back up. I made the statement, maybe I should run. And unfortunately, or fortunately, how you look at it, it took off like wildfire. It was like a ground, boom, an explosion. And all of a sudden, Jesse Ventura, we want Jesse for governor. Da 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 da, it started. And I was in a corner now, I thought, because you made that statement, and I backed myself in a corner to where I felt I had to run. Now, during the thought process, would I be a Democrat or Republican? Oh no, I knew right away. Uh, I knew I would not be a Democrat or Republican because I had never been one. And I wasn't about to start now. When I got into the race legitimately, there were already scheduled debates and the two big guns for the Repubs and Dems weren't there yet, I guess. And nobody knew who they were going to nominate. So there was an array of other different candidates, as I spoke earlier, Mike Freeman and, and Mondale and a few others like that. In fact, the former lieutenant governor was thrown in there too, uh, for, who, who, from Arne Carlson, who had just uh, left office after two terms. and. Uh, so then it started to build up and then as we got more towards we didn't know till it got to their conventions you had to wait till the republican and democratic conventions to see who they were going to pick and then of course it went to the conventions and coleman and humphrey came out victoriously easily which the press said to me they asked me who would you like to see and I, I was bold and brash i said i want humphrey and coleman i want their two biggest guns i want to beat the best I want to send me their best so I can beat the best. And that's the attitude I took. I didn't want no excuses from them. I wanted them to send me who they thought their best candidate was so that when I beat them, I would beat their best. 
And that way there'd be no judgment later of, well, if we'd have put so-and-so forward instead, maybe he would have beat Jesse Ventura. We don't know. But uh, no, I wanted the two big names and got them. You know, and then, <coughs> then <coughs> at that point, which was Labor Day, I was polling 10% statewide. Humphrey was at about 46, Coleman was at 32. And uh, the Democrats, because I had debated already so much, the Democrats thought I would take votes from Coleman. So the Democrats came out and said they would not debate unless I was included. Now this seemed like the honorable thing to do in front of everybody, which it was. But their real motive was what I said earlier. They thought I'd take votes from Coleman. That's why they wanted me in there. Well, I got in the debates, got in the first debate, and then the meteoric rise started. As soon as that first debate took place, I went from 10% and started rising fast in the polls. Humphrey, Coleman, and the Democrats started panicking. Uh, they, I think, realized that they had made a major mistake at that point politically in allowing me in the debates. Now what could they do about it? Well, they immediately started canceling debates. You know, we ended up, I think, having three or four major debates, but we were supposed to have about six because they saw what was happening and they were smart enough to see, uh-oh, we don't want to be on the stage with this guy or something bad could happen. And, but they couldn't stop it at that point. The momentum started rolling. The ball started rolling. The timing was perfect. As the two other debates took place, I got stronger and stronger. And the reason was is because I took a technique where I didn't run against them. I didn't care who they put forward. I ran against the two political parties and the baggage they have. And if you run against the two political parties as a third, they're, they're dead meat, they're easy, because they have so much baggage and they can't run from it. And in fact, a couple ways that I got them during the debates, I remember Skip Humphrey canceled a debate that we were going to have in front of all the high school kids in Minnesota. He canceled out of it and instead sat in a luxury suite at the Minnesota Viking game that week. So I called him out on it and said, why did you cancel a debate to attend the Vikings game? Said it right on the debates to him. You know, I, I debated a new style. You know, I called them out. And on Norm Coleman, he started making all these big promises again. And I called him out with, well, Mayor Coleman, two years ago, I heard you make the same promises to the people of St. Paul. You haven't even fulfilled your commitment to them. And now you're making the same promises to the state of Minnesota. Why don't you finish your job in St. Paul before you decide to go to the state of Minnesota? And that resonated with people. So when I started to rise in the polls, of course, in the world of politics, momentum is everything, I think. And I got the momentum. And the elections were only the first week in November and they couldn't stop that momentum. And once it caught fire and took hold and started rolling, the two parties did everything they possibly could. I mean, I remember when Humphrey, they brought in Hillary Clinton. When Hillary came to town <coughs> that weekend before the election, she made the quote that it was, it was time to end the carnival show and truly elect the next governor. In other words, equating me to a carnival show. And I took offense to that and I thought, well, Hillary, if you're going to shoot a shot over my bow, then get ready because that's the kind of person I am. So when the press ran up to me to ask me, Hillary Clinton says you're a carnival act and that they should end the carnival show and truly elect the new governor now. And I said to her, well, I said this to the press. I said, well, it seems to me that Hillary should worry more about leaving Bill home alone at the White House rather than worrying about who wins the governor in the state of Minnesota. You know, and I didn't truly want to take that kind of shot at her, but I thought, wait a minute, lady, if you're going to walk into my state and tell me, say to the people of Minnesota that I'm a carnival act, well, then you've opened the door. 
and, and I'm the type of person as a Navy SEAL, people need to understand, we live by a simple rule. We don't get mad, we get even. <laughs> and I've never escaped that. Blame Mother Moy, blame them instructors for putting that in my brain. But I don't get mad, I get even. So if you take a shot over my bow, you're going to get one back. And do you think the people responded to that energy? And do you think they liked it? They loved that? it. They loved the humor of it, I think. I don't know. I didn't, you know, I didn't, when I ran, I didn't hold a finger to the poles. I wasn't supposed to win anyway. So why worry about the poles? Why worry about which way they're blowing? You know, I went out, no, I think I won because people finally saw, let me say this maybe, this is a, the greatest, how would we call it, oxymoron? People finally saw an honest politician. The demographics of how I won, which was a great deal of young people voting, uh, those things happen because of a very simple thing. I paid attention to them. And the normal candidates don't. Why? Young people don't contribute money. They don't have it. <laughs> you know, young people, are they're trying to make their way in. They're poor. Okay, you got working and middle class people. They don't have the money to join a PAC or a political action committee or pay enough dough to get an audience with a candidate. You got to pay thousands of dollars. What average person can afford to do that just for political influence? And the public knew I didn't accept PAC money. I wasn't accepting special interest money. So I think Joe, Joe Citizen and John Young person knew they had somebody who would listen to them and would pay attention to them. But I also challenged them. I challenged the young people. I knew they'd pay off for me. You know how I knew it? Because the young people had never had Jesse the Body Ventura to vote for. Call it what you want, a novelty or anything, but they had somebody who excited them and who came out. I purposely went to every college. Kids were hanging from the rafters and I told them, the reason they don't pay attention to you is because you don't vote. If you hold their job in the palm of your hands, they will then pay attention to you. I, the job you want me to do is in the palm of your hands. It's up to you. You want to send me there? Vote. Well, it paid off because I'll never forget the next day after I won the election, the Minneapolis paper, the headline was Ventura wins. The sub-headline underneath and smaller, but still predominant, campaign brings out throngs of young voters. And the other thing we had the advantage on, Minnesota is a progressive, wonderful state in the fact that you have same-day registration here. Voting should not be hard. Voting should be easy. They came out, young people in droves, and the independent people in droves because they finally had a candidate where they could slap the Republicans and the Democrats in the face and say, wait a minute, we still have the power. And that's what happened in 98. And, uh, but you were... The main thing is you were cheering then, we're cheering now, and again, I don't know what else to say. We've shocked the world. Minnesota leads the way. We, we lead the way in setting the example for the rest of the country that hopefully Hopefully the Democrats and the Republicans will take notice now. They will stop, wait, wait. They will stop their partisan party politics and start doing what's right for the people.